All right, this is No Excuses with Michael DeLeonardo. I'm your host, R.J. Roger. Michael, how are you? No, very good, thank you. And yourself? Everything's well. Everything's like good. You got some great shirts. You've been in oh. my You've been taking the time out of class? No. <laughs> no. no, it's just the color you like, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like the colors of the button downs. Oh. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Well, sometimes when I made my shirts, I, I would have where the, the buttons are, the dress shirts. Uh, they would make a, a piece of material over there so you didn't see the buttons. Okay. I never had a shirt made. Oh, <laughs> Everything yeah. I buy is off the rack. It's not. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about an interesting story today. It's not a lot of um, discussion that or a lot of... I haven't really seen anyone really talk much about... I heard Sliwa, Curtis Sliwa talk, but I never really heard a kind of an inside account on what happened with Curtis Sliwa. Well, um, Curtis Sliwa talked enough for everybody. Nobody else has anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he talked a lot, but we never had anybody the other story. That's what um, we do on this channel. We show the other story. <laughs> it was in the courtroom several times. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, outside in the public forum, no, not really. I don't remember that. Outside of him. Yeah. So Sliwa was like pretty like disc jockey, DJ, a, a radio personality? Yeah, more of a radio personality, uh, crime fighter type. Um, came from the street. I, I think he had, a, he had a good program. You know, I really think he had not, not his voice in a radio program, what he was doing with the city. You know, a patrol in the streets. He had the the guardian angels, the red bandanas, hats, and etc. I think he had a good a good thing to start. Uh, it wasn't a vigilante group by any means, and uh, like I said, I think it was uh, introduced at the right time when the city was in trouble and people couldn't ride subways. Yesterday, they issued the crime reports for the subway last year, and crime shot up fifteen percent. There were more major felonies in the past twelve months than in the previous year. And they criticized when I gave the orders in early January to renew our efforts in the subways, resurrect our efforts, and begin to flood the subways with guardian angels. And uh, with these guys that Sliwa had on subways and, uh, and in the streets, I think you got uh, a little piece of security for some. Because yeah. they were misunderstood in the beginning, because a lot of these guys look rough. And that's what you needed in New York people, you know, so... Uh, you, you can't have somebody that doesn't look rough trying to take care of ruffian, so to say, you know? So I think he started out with the good thing, uh, as a good thing. Uh, the cops hated him because he just, he was, he was uh, trying to be crime fighter and they were the cops. They felt like, you know, like they weren't doing enough, a good, a good job in the city that they need somebody else, a civilian coming along with a civilian party. So there was a lot of resentment. And then he had a lot of things that we found out later on. Uh, false police reports, uh, false crimes that were being reported by him just to get attention, uh, media seeking. But he wanted to bring attention to his, his group. I realized after the case and all of that, I, what he really wanted to do. Uh, you know, I think he really wanted to do the right thing for the city. and Because he's still continuing. He's still continuing still today. So uh, he made some mistakes with, uh, with the wrong people. And that was our, our family at the time. Um, but before we start that, if, if I may, you know, he wasn't the only one that was a big voice against the Gaudis and the mob <clears throat> in general. There was a reporter named for work for the New York Post, a writer, Mike McAlary. Now, he was a legitimate reporter for the New York Post. And he was another guy just crushing the Gaudis and, uh, and just about everybody in the street. Um, and uh, Junior had said that he wanted to give this guy a beating before Sliwa. And we went down to the New York Post, Junior and I, and we scoped out the New York Post. And the only thing I, you know, I was saying to Junior, the thing he was really cautious about, but he was really mad, and uh, just like with Sliwa, is that um, this guy's a real reporter. And you know what happens if you assault a reporter or you hurt a reporter. It, it's good. Never ending. Everybody's going to jump on you. It's going to cause a lot of bad attention. So Junior says, now nah, we'll just give him a beating. We won't hurt him that bad. And uh, okay. So we sat on that for a while. And a funny story. Well, maybe not funny. Um, 
but ironic, let's say. I had a bad Sunday betting football, and I go to a place called Turquoise, a discotheque in Brooklyn. And um, I go in there, and one of the guys from the West Side, Ali Shades, had some guys around him, and they come in with these girls, the Bobby twins at this time. They were very hot in, uh, in, in, in that business at that time. Uh, very sexual, volu voluptuous women, and they were making their name for themselves. And they bring them over, and, and, and to me, and we're talking, and we're kibitzing around. And now I went from a very bad mood to a very good mood, you know, having a couple of drinks. And who walks in the bar? Mike McAlary. And I'm there, you know, I don't have anybody, Mike. I'm just there myself, you know. And I look over, and I go, oh, look who's held up in this place. Now I'm starting to wait. Do I go call somebody? A couple of my friends went outside, give them this beating. <laughs> or do I hang out with these girls? Uh, the girls went out. I said we could catch McAlary a different time. Uh, so that was one incident that way Junior was had his ire up about somebody. And the other one was a guy named Richard Bay, a TV personality. And uh, I've never told you about that. I guess I catch you by surprise. I see. No, I didn't know any of this. Yeah. So Richard Bay is another guy who was, had a big mouth and uh, was on TV and just bashing the Gottis again. And um, there was no no edict for going to do anything to him. Uh, but I was up in Columbus on Columbus. It was a bar on the west side. A lot of uh, TV personalities hung out in there. Me, just Philbin, et cetera. You know, at that time, um, actors, Broadway people. So it was a good little spot for me to escape. There was a few Italians that, hung out with that found that spot and wanted to go up there. So I was up there one night, and who's in the restaurant? Richard Bay. So I wait for him to go to the bathroom. Then I walk in behind him, and I'm taking a, a leak right next to him. And I go, hey, you're, you're Richard Bay, huh? Yeah. He goes, I want to make sure, you know? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I says, you know, you really have a big mouth. In these contexts, he's, he looks at me, right? I says, you got to keep the Gotti name out of your mouth. He shit himself, this guy. And that was it. He went back to the stable, got the girl he was with, and left. Wow. That's interesting. Now, let me ask you, <clears throat> because these guys would all be viewed as outsiders, unaffiliated, not doing business with the mob, denied that they are completely just... Square, square guys. Yeah, what has been said is that you know the quote unquote we only kill ourselves, we don't bother the public, um, and essentially the public's you know they have it's fair game. Like if they have something to say, they're not they're just doing their job. So why would a New York Post reporter or this guy? Um, maybe you can make a different argument for Sleewood because he was really gone to a different level. But these two other guys, let's say, why would those kind of guys be given a beating by the mob when they're just square guys, outsiders doing their job? Well, it, it is crossing the line for us because McAlary did write about the mob in general. He didn't just attack Gotti's. Uh, Richard Bay just, well, I guess, wanted to be funny on TV. He, he didn't realize the war that he was getting into. And... Um, Sleewell was relentless. He was just relentless. Yeah, it is crossing the line. Like I said, uh, McAlary was a writer, and you really can't go after anybody in the press like that. Um, but, you know, when people get angry and, you know, you cross, they, they feel like they crossed that line, as, as did Sleewood did, because Sleewood really crossed the line by talking about Vicky. I think that's what done it, John's sister or John's daughter. You know, and um, I think that's what really got Junior pissed off. He was making fun of her. Um, and he went after Jeannie with the drugs. Again, fair game, but he was relentless. And if Sliwa, if you listen to him and you are objective and you've got nothing to do with the mob, he's a funny bastard. He's a very witty guy, you know. And he has all these uh, uh, rhyming sayings and theories, and uh, he's pretty good at it. But he can get on your skin when you just don't stop. And he didn't stop. For some reason, and I think he's half Italian. I think he just, something happened in his youth with Italians where he felt like this is the time to get even. Uh, something had to happen. Somebody, it, it like, uh, hypothetically took his lunch money. 
and he had this little vendetta, you know. So uh, maybe he could explain it. Uh, but he, he poked he he poked that bear a little too much at that time. Now, was this just the junior thing and a you thing? You guys are very close, and you guys are fucking annoyed by this, or was this talked about by many people in the family? Uh, I would say the whole city. I mean, this guy, this guy was relentless. Everybody knows. No, no, no. I, I mean, within within the Gambinos, I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. It... yeah I, I see what you mean now. Uh, yeah, we talked about it often. Okay. Every time I opened his big mouth. Okay. So the first, the initial thing was there was some type of attack with a baseball bat. Yeah. John said he wanted to do something. And then one day uh, we were in Florida and Sleewer had gotten beat up uh, with guys by, with baseball bats. I think they, they might have broke his arm, if I recall. Not too sure. But he was on the news going crazy again. He identified guys. He's, he swore to have masks. And he identified a guy who threw his eyes and really ridiculous his, uh, his IDing of, of, of certain people. Uh, Junior had lawyers involved, uh, you know, trying to get guys arrested. Uh, for, for the assault and um, he just wouldn't stop again he got worse the attack he just you know he didn't give up so he should have just backed away and left it alone and uh, he got worse and the attacks continued like I said and, and then he started talking about John's sister and I think that pushed it over the edge it's to me it's I mean even with the public notoriety that he had I <sighs> You have to wonder, this guy must have brass balls. I mean, he was talking about, and this is the era where there was bodies everywhere. I mean, you guys were the era, that 80s era was, it was a war zone out there. Um, <laughs> that's the part for me that I think, man, this guy, he never backed up. He didn't fear, I mean, he didn't seem to have any like real fear to keep on going and get, and as you said, after the first warning, baseball bat, a baseball batting, to come back and be even more relentless. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, you touch the stove, you get burned. Tell little kids, don't touch that stove, you're going to get burned. You got burned. And you can't come back from all. Uh, you know, I'm, it, it, for my position in my life, he deserved it. He should have shut his mouth. He didn't deserve to die for it, right? There's a level of punishment in anything you do in life. But uh, he deserved to get another beating to shut his mouth. Maybe he learned. You know, um, and he, he was relentless. You know, I got to give him credit for it. He's a credit of very stupid. And I don't think he's a stupid guy. I think he's a very smart guy. I just think what you said, he, his, his balls got, he twisted his balls even more. And he says, I'm not letting anybody scare me away. I think that's exactly what happened with him. But you had to know you did it once. What do you think these guys are going to quit? You 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 get you're doing even more. So you know you it's the mob, it's the gangsters. You're not going to chase them away. They're not going to stand down. <laughs> um. So after the initial baseball batting, you say he didn't listen. He gets worse. Um. Starts attacking <clears throat> the family even more viciously than he was previously. So Junior's even more upset. He's even more pissed than he was the first time. So what happens next? Uh, approximately a month or so later or sometime later. Later. Well, what happened was Junior says uh, one day, look, we're going to take a ride to New York. We're going to see where he lives. He got his address. I don't know how he got his address, but he got his address. And uh, we I think it was Alphabet City. And we walked around him and I, and we looked at the house, the building he was in, and, uh, um, you know, was doing a little surveillance our, ourselves to see what it was. And then a little bit later, uh, he tells me, go into Brooklyn and um, get Big Louie, Valerio, and Little Joey, and meet me out in Cross Bay Boulevard. There was a diner out there. I said the carousel when I testified, but uh, it, wasn't the, it wasn't that name. It was another name. I just... Didn't remember exactly what it was. I thought it was at the time. So I pick up Joe because Lou Valeria wasn't there. I believe he was in Atlantic City at the time. And Louie was his captain, even though Joey was an associate at the time. We were trying to get something under his belt so we could straighten him out. Uh, 
what wound up happening later on is Jackie D'Amico and myself proposed Joey. Lou Valerio did not. He, after Sammy flipped and all that, things were um, not sitting well, and he lost a little strength. But the junior kept to his credit, kept Louis as a captain, so Louis deserved it. Uh, so he's away, and uh, we go out to Queens Cross Bay, and uh, I meet Junior there. It was uh, Nicky Carrazzo, Mike, um, and a few other guys on the side, and we all sit down at a table, small some small talk. And now Mike was an associate of, of Nicky. Nicky was a captain by now. And uh, Mike was a very tough guy, very dependable, very serious, extremely close to Nikki, and um, would do anything Nikki asked. Uh, good guy for that life. Not made, you said, right? Not made. Okay. Yeah, he was going to get something under his belt, too, to put on his resume. Okay. Right. And I had, D'Angelo, what was his? He was his yeah. also. Okay. And was he in the same situation trying to get some credit under his belt? Yeah, he didn't know it. He didn't have a ass to get straightened out. It's just that uh, what I seen in him and in, uh, in life, because he, he was uh, his father was uh, murdered in the street, uh, and actually in the bar, uh, was a really good guy, very close to Gravano. Uh, terrible thing the way he died. He would die for zero reason from a nut. That's another story, another time again. Uh, but Joey was a good guy, very close to Sam. And when Sammy flipped, uh, I got very, very close with Joey. And I like Joey very much. So, uh, you know, he was still in Louis de Jean, but uh, we, we got very friendly. Okay. Now, at this meeting, <laughs> Junior says, you all sit down at the table. And I found this quote. He says, you guys are brought here to do a piece of work for the family. What did he mean by? Well, when he, when he first states that, I think we're going to kill somebody. You know, a piece of work usually means somebody's going to somebody's going to die. Uh, and the contents Junior meant here was uh, we're going to have to do a deed for the family. We're going to have to do something for the family, and that that's this beating for Sliwa coming up. Um. So, and Nicky Carrazzo, he's there. You said. Yes. With me. Now, what's his role in this whole thing? You told me about D'Angelo and uh, Mike, but what's Nikki's purpose of being there? Well, Nikki's Mike's captain, even though Mike's a so uh, associate, he's not a soldier. He's his captain, and uh, John's given him a very important detail to take care of. Because you don't give it to me. You don't give it to Louis Valerio. He gives it to Nick to handle it, supervise this. Okay. So were there plans hatched out there at the table or were just orders given out there at the table? That's it. Orders. Nick, you're going to use Joey and Mike and whoever else you want. And uh, Nikki is going to supervise the whole thing. Okay. So how this would go down, it wasn't something that you or Junior would have even known. I asked her how it was going to happen. Well, we, again, we had the uh, address, so, you know, we knew where he lived. With the specifics on how it was going to be done, I was not involved. I was not involved after that at all. Matter of fact, Junior and I, I don't, I don't believe we talked about it until uh, it happened. Because it wasn't my business, and uh, Joey was with Louie, like I said, and uh, Joey had a, a job to do right now, and I wasn't going to call him in and ask what's going on, what's going on. It wasn't my business at this point anymore. Okay. Um, but Junior made it clear, you're saying, this was just a beating, and it shouldn't go any further than that. 100%. Baseball, bad beating. He says he wants to give him as bad as beating without killing him, putting him in the hospital, but as bad as beating he could get without killing him, of course. The last time they broke his arm, I believe. He, he didn't shut up. Maybe this time a little bit more, maybe a little more time in the hospital will cure him, <laughs> I guess. Funny to me now, but the... The guy, the, the the guy almost died. Well, we'll get to it. Go ahead. Yeah. So in this, but so in this situation, there's a break. There's, there's no reason to need a gun because he's not. He don't want no one killed. So no Correct. gun would be needed for this. Correct. In my eyes. Exactly. You bring a gun. You bring a gun. You gotta be ready to use it. And exactly. so no, you don't shoot somebody to wound them. All right. So now take me through the course of events. So what happens following 
like with Sliwa. So how's this whole thing play out? Yeah. Well, I hear about it and um, on the news. And I go look for little Joey, D'Angelo. And I find him. And uh, he was pretty upset. Uh, he starts to tell me what happened in the story. Uh, but he was upset with Mike because Mike, as they would, they picked up, what that happened is they pick him up in the stolen cab. And in the cab, they took, you know, you, you, the door latches to get out. They rigged it where you couldn't open the door. It stayed locked. The only thing that worked was the window. But the door, you couldn't get out. You were trapped in the back seat. Right? So when he gets in, he Sliwa must have sensed there was somebody up front or something was wrong. Because they started going in the wrong direction from where he wanted to go. Joey was the cab driver. And Mike was sitting in the front seat on the floor, like squatted all the way down. down. So when Sliwa must have felt where you're going or uh, he heard some noise up front, uh, Mike tried to pull out a gun and try to hold him at, like at bay. And Sliva, from what he says, was slapping the gun. And Joey said he was trying to slap the gun out of Mike's hand. And uh, then uh, Mike opened fire on him. He shot and why him. did Sliva get into the cab? He was going to work or wherever he was going. They had his routine down. They watched him for days and got his routine. Uh, and he always jumped in the cab. And they put a cab really close to where he lived. So they, he'd be the cab that they called. And, you know, for him, it was the wrong cab to get in. All right, so he's in the car. Mike pulls out a gun. Gun goes off, hits Sliwa. Several times. Several times. Yeah. So now when, when Mike shoots him, uh, Sliwa trying to get out of the car. He couldn't. So now he rolls down the window. This guy's a tough guy. I mean, this guy fought. He could have just... You know, just submitted there and started crying, but he didn't. He fought. And uh, he rolls down the window. Now he's smart enough to roll down the window, and he's trying to jump out the window. And little Joey's taking the car, trying to hit parked cars to knock him off. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was he's like he, he getting real close to parked cars, trying to knock his head off. You know, they, that had, he shot him, you know, and finally Slew Sle Sle threw himself out the window. So then we're going to put him in the car, drive him to a spot, Right, get him out and then give him that beating wherever that spot was. But it would, they never made it. He he caught the move. Now, in my mind, when I think about all this, from just, I would think after something goes that bad, <laughs> they went haywire. The guy already took a couple bullets, at least two. Yeah, at least two. He's out of the window now. He's still appearing, appears to be alive. Isn't there a plan B now? Okay, we already botched this. We gotta shouldn't there isn't there a thought like we should probably finish the job now? So there's no or you just so they or they just left. Oh they had, yeah, no, you had it, you had a jet out of there. Absolutely. Uh no way. It wasn't a hit. It wasn't supposed to be a murder. But he already shot him twice. I know, I know, but you're not gonna stop the kid and get out and kill him because it's still not supposed to be a murder. Okay. Still, only supposed to be a beaten. Now, if you get out and you kill him, now you're gonna go back to them and say you really assassinated this guy. He wasn't supposed to be. Look, let me explain this, and this is for Curtis also. If he's, if I'm sure he'll find this and listen to it and get mad at me again. Uh, but if this was a hit, as soon as he gets in that cab, he's gone. His body never gets found. He's buried somewhere. Simple as that. He gets in, he shoots him in his face, he shoots him in his chest, as many bullets as you get in out of a nine millimeter. And that's it. He's gone. This not was not a murder. It was not set up to be that. A bad beating. So uh, they really didn't try to kill him. Did you, Mike Gennady shoot him? He did. But Sleewa went on this tirade of it was an attempted assassination of, of him. Well, once you get shot, that's, what are you thinking? You're thinking Fair maybe you watched him. Yeah. You know, but yeah. on play the record again, I said it in the courtroom, but I'll say it again. It was not a hit. It was an assault that went really wrong. Okay. Now, you were at this table at this meeting, and there's no question. It was clear this was not supposed to happen. This was supposed to be a beating and that's it. <laughs> this was not supposed, there's no way that Mike could have missed 
nothing. This guy just went rogue, essentially. Well, whatever was in his head either. I, no, I never spoke to him about this. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what he thought. I'm sure Nikki uh, speak to him after this, say what happened. I'm sure Junior had to speak to him after this, say what happened, say what happened. You know, uh, and, and the gun, uh, you know, I, I don't know. You're going to give somebody beat and don't bring that gun because yeah. bad things could happen. So That's, what's your first reaction? Everybody does their business their way, but rule of thumb is you, you don't bring a gun if you're going to give somebody a beating. Bad things happen. So it's all over the news. I don't have no recollection of anything back then, but I'm guessing they're talking about game, possible game mob hit or attempted mob hit is probably what I think. And you know in your mind, shit, I was at that sit down. The, the planning for this, if this guy dies, I mean, so what's your uh, first reaction? Are you in fear that you're tied into a murder, or a murder conspiracy? Are you afraid that this thing could end up bringing us all down? Like, what's your immediate thoughts? No, my immediate thought, I, when I spoke to little Joey, he wasn't happy when I found him. He explained what happened. He says, uh, Mike just got up and got up and started shooting this guy. He wasn't, Joey was not happy with Mike in the whole situation at that time. Uh, so I, I went out and seen Junior, and he he was unhappy. He was angry. He says, I said, what happened here? So he's pissed off. He says, yeah, Mike, this was a clusterfuck. That was his exact words. And I, and he says, I, you know, I didn't talk to Nicky about it. And we never really, I don't think we talked about it again. Well, we might have a little bit, but I don't, there was no, no impactful statements coming back from Junior to me, from uh, from uh, Nikki or anything like that. It just we're trying to make it just go away. Not even a conversation piece, I guess. So, was there any police questioning? Anybody? So, what like, what happened? What's the next course of events that happened? Like, there's Sliwa. Like, how did this whole thing end up playing out? Oh, well, he almost died. He got hit pretty pretty bad. Yeah, he had I think several operations after that. Yeah, he, he wasn't, but he still, his mouth was the same. So he uh, didn't stop even after this one, huh? Yeah, he, he wasn't at that level anymore, no way. No, he was in, really like almost incapacitated. He was laid off for a while, for, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he was hurt pretty bad. I've been shot, I've been stabbed. You know, that's not the answer. Give him a lot of credit, he's a strong guy. He's got a strong constitution, strong will, and physically strong. He had to be physically strong. And quick thinking, jump out a window. That's just something like a movie. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of people don't know what they would do with a gun pointed at them and bullets going in them. It's that old saying of fight, uh, fight, flight, or freeze. You could freeze up. You could, like, fight back. You could try to flee. I mean, but he was must have been of, of right mind. Got to save my life. Got to go for the... Well, he, he was a martial artist, from, if I remember correctly. He was into martial arts, so they, they, you have a little more mind control with, in those situations. You train for them, you know, uh, I guess. And uh, like I said, to his credit. And again, if if Curtis thinks about it, you know, if Mike didn't initially shoot him, he tried to hold him at bay. You know, he tried to just tell him to stay still. But, you know, take it for you, like you just said, what do you do? You got to fight. And that's what he did. He was going to sit still and say, all right, let me let this guy get a good shot at me, you know, or let him take me wherever they're taking me and kill me there. You know, I'm in a, I'm in a, in a car in the middle of the city, you know, downtown Manhattan. Let me see if I create, get some noise, try to jump out of the window, whatever he was doing. He, he saved his own life, that's for sure. So what comes of D'Angelo and Mike? Is there, I mean, something that bad, especially for Mike, you you go that far off the rails, you get put on the shelves for that. Like, is there a no, 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 nothing, nothing at all? You know, uh, he, he he was involved in something that was very serious. Became very serious. The kid's an extremely stand up guy. And uh, if there was anything that was uh, spoken to him about, I have, like I said, I don't know. Have that conversation, but how that was handled. So uh, he's good enough guy not to break his spirit, but. Maybe, you know, I, I, I don't want to even guess what the conversation was because I don't know. Yeah. So you never heard much about it after that? No. No. Okay. He was in good graces. He was in good graces. So, okay. was, so was Joey. I know how you felt then, but 
now you're so far removed from it. Do you have a different perspective on him, or do you feel like, no, this guy really was crossing a line, like, he, or it was he 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 got what he was asking for. He was, you know, the guy now is he 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 just ran for mayor of New York. He's just this, you know, he's still out there. He still talks. I think he's even he tells his story a lot. You know, it's like his claim to fame. I went to war with the Gambinos, and I, and and they couldn't take me down. You know, it was like a badge of honor almost for him. But like, so how do you look? How do you look back on it? He should have shut his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cheek, right? You play uh, with fire, you get burned, right? You get played with fire, you get burned. You got you got the they they salted you. Is that enough? You know, uh again, but that's just part of his makeup, his personality. The guy tries to do a lot of good things for New York City. And it's not it he's with the the test of decades trying to do something good for the city with his group. And um he ran for me, he did. He's still a funny bastard. He's still ornery. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he I, I know he's got a spot in hell for me and Junior. Did you, um? do you think Senior had anything to do? Or this was complete, like this, the Senior ever express any? Or he wouldn't have? No? Mm. Yeah, he, Senior had, uh, I don't know if I told this one. The, you know, there's a cop, Joe Coffey. I don't think, I, not to me, I don't remember hearing nothing about it. He died, big name in law enforcement. When he was sitting in MCC, uh, for some reason, him and Joe Coffey really didn't like each other. And I was in Bankers and Brokers restaurant, and I would meet Jackie there sometimes if, uh, if they seen John, if I didn't drive him up. And uh, he comes out, he says, uh, John wants me to tell you something. I said, what is it? So he said, um, Joe Coffey, he wants you to give him a beating. Joe Coffey? He carries a gun about this big, you know? So I said, uh, really? He says, yeah. He says, uh, he says, you're a good guy. You're a good kid. He give it to you. He knows it's not going to go anywhere. I said, Okay. So I stopped finding out where this hangs out. One of the places he hung out was a restaurant in, uh, up in Manhattan called Elaine's. And um, Jackie comes back to me one day. He says, uh, forget about it. It's off. He, he called it off. Ironically, another time, I'm sitting there with uh, Alley Boy Presco. And who walks in? Joe Coffey sitting at the bar. He dressed like a gangster. He thought he was a gangster. You know, but he hated Italians for some reason. He hated Italians. Uh, mob guy Italians, I guess. I don't know how he felt across the board with other Italians. But he played a role there. So look at this guy. He don't know how lucky he came to get the beaten, too. So, guys, thank you. Um, let me know what you think about um, Curtis Lewa story. Leave leave comments. Leave, leave feedback. Um, and we'll do a live. If you want to ask any questions, any additional questions, we'll we'll answer those questions. Um, so, yeah, Michael. Well, I'll tell you, our Patreon family is really growing. Uh, a lot of great feedback, great questions. Again, intelligent people. Our lives are fantastic. Um, let's keep it going. Because I think everybody's getting learning a little bit from each other, including me, for sure. And RJ, you too. You know, we learn about people in, in here and uh, what they think about this genre and uh, even us, their opinions, which is flattering. Uh, they don't think they're being fooled on here, which yeah. is very important to me and you. Uh, yeah. and, and that's very important. Agreed. All right. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Take care.